You know, you go, you're confronted with the image. It has its impact. That's pleasure, that's moment. But then connoisseurship is you start scraping and digging and digging, and then the pleasure is much bigger. I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. So, what is connoisseurship, and what does it mean in the present day when ChatGPT or plain old Google can answer nearly any art historical question at the drop of a keystroke? It's a pressing question in the art field, and it was the topic of an enlightening panel discussion at TFOF New York last week that we recorded live for The Art Angle. Here it is. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for coming to join us at the Park Avenue Armory on this beautiful spring afternoon. Let's turn back the clock for a moment to set the scene. About 125 years ago, not so far away from here, the legendary European art dealer Joseph Duveen was once granted an audience with J.P. Morgan, who wanted to test the dealer's connoisseurship before doing business with him. As the story goes, the banking tycoon displayed five valuable Chinese porcelain vases and told Duveen that some were real and some were fakes, challenging him to identify the fraudulent vessels. So Duveen examined them and, lifting his cane, abruptly smashed two of the vases into smithereens. They were fakes. Morgan was impressed, and Duveen went on to sell him a fortune's worth of art. So we are here today to talk about connoisseurship, and that almost mythic tale distills the key qualities that we associate with a connoisseur. Subject matter expertise, assured judgment as an arbiter of the good and the bad, all delivered with panache. But is that the whole story? And how is our view of connoisseurship changing today in our digital era? To discuss, we are fortunate to have three very distinguished people here today who you could describe as connoisseurs of connoisseurship. Dominique Levy is a veteran dealer who has played nearly every role that the art market has to offer on both sides of the Atlantic, and today is the L in LGDR, the Blue Chip Gallery Supergroup that she founded with Brett Gorvey, Amalia Diane, and Jeannie greenberg Rohatton. Thomas Kaplan is a businessman, philanthropist, conservationist, and geopolitical player who also happens to be perhaps the greatest living collector of Dutch Golden Age art, with a collection called the Leiden Collection that includes the largest private holdings of Rembrandt and the only Vermeer in private hands. I have wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, on the other side of the generational spectrum, we have Michael Diaz Griffith. <laughs> Not all the way. <laughs> That's part of the way. Let's, I, when I say generational, I talk about Rembrandt. <laughs> Understood. Um, is a 30 something uh, collector, antique specialist, and now author of the book The New Antiquarians, a fascinating look at the rising generation of tastemakers who are making old objects newly relevant. So, welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk connoisseurship. So, Dominique, let's begin with you. You are, among other things, an expert in mid-century and post-war artists. Fontana, Yves Klein, Calder, Soulage, de Kooning, Twombly, Gunter Ucker. Gunter Ucker. Your program, wherever you've gone, has always been known for its taste, refinement, and its intellectual rigor. So, I put to you, what is connoisseurship, and how do you attain it, and how did you attain it? So I was thinking about this word of connoisseurship, and I was reading the different definition, and I felt they all were sort of right and wrong. I came to the conclusion thinking about today that it's a very mixed bag of spices connoisseurship because I think it comes with experience. By definition, you're not born with connoisseurship. It comes with study and research, effort, I would say. It comes with a sense of discernment and taste, but I find it very different than expertise. You can have expertise and no connoisseurship for and we'll see what our friends here say, but I think connoisseurship is a way of looking, being curious, engaged, passionate, learning, and then diving deep when you want to go from connoisseurship to expertise. But they dance together. And the question of taste, I'm not sure it has to do with connoisseurship because taste is so subjective. And yes, when I try to do an exhibition or a booth, I put a lot of vision or taste it so happened, and I hope, that sometimes it has pockets of connoisseurship. But I think all that has to be separated. And then I think connoisseurship has an enormous amount of pleasure 
associated with it that I'm not sure we, we talk enough about. I think that's true. The expertise sounds much more scientific mm -hmm. than connoisseurship, which is almost a humanist Absolutely. pursuit. Absolutely. The Renaissance man is, is connoisseur by definition. So that's a good segue to the Renaissance man. Thomas, would you agree with Dominique's uh, definition of connoisseurship? In essence, yes. But again, I would also say that we have to understand that connoisseurship, by definition, changes through the ages. In other words, the kind of connoisseurship that's required if one wishes to go that deep into the subject of, for example, old masters, is going to necessitate a different sensibility than the connoisseurship that follows after Marcel Duchamp changes the concept of what art is. So for example, Rembrandt, as I've often stated with massive conviction, was the most impactful painter of all time, simply because before Rembrandt and after Rembrandt, you have a different appreciation of the concept of what beauty is and the ability to express it. Rembrandt, through his own internal machinations, but also his brushwork, liberated future artists to be able to express themselves and to express their own perception of beauty, which sometimes can be very ugly in their own way. And this is extremely important. So between Rembrandt and Goya, for example, you have a very wide gap. And Goya was incredibly taken with Rembrandt, and so was Delacroix, and so was Turner, and Van Gogh was obsessed with Rembrandt. Picasso would always return to the subject of Rembrandt when he would speak about his greatest influences. And then you carry that through to Francis Bacon and Zhang Fanji in China will say that Rembrandt was his formative influence. I'm not even talking about artists like Jenny Saville and Lucien Freud, which are more obvious, but basically if you look at the art that was created by those who were most influenced or had tremendous influence from Rembrandt, you see him as a liberator. But you also have to recognize that in Rembrandt's time, that which made him such a great genius, particularly his late period, when he is more impressionistic, expressionistic, abstract, also made him far less popular. So he was famous, but less of a currency, but he was doing what he wanted to do. And that changes the trajectory of painting. When you look at painting today, what's required of connoisseurship, the ability to distinguish between a Rembrandt and a Rembrandt pupil, for example, because of familiarity and looking, 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 going to visit paintings, which is something that I did from the age of six when I fell in love with Rembrandt, visiting him for the first time at the Met. And I would go out of my way to visit museums to connect with Rembrandt and then ultimately his school, etc. But that level of what you might call connoisseurship or an affinity is so different than the last century. First of all, attribution issues are far less prevalent. You have many more records of what artists did and when, and on occasion, in-depth profiles of what they were trying to say, either sometimes by themselves or by others. We really have very little of that in the 17th century Dutch art. Not everything is signed. Sometimes you do have to rely on pigment analysis and x-rays. It's different. That doesn't mean that there isn't connoisseurship, but I think the concept of connoisseurship, which originates, of course, with the Latin to know, changes when you already know who the artist is and when it was painted. And now you have to put it within the context of how important is it along that arc of art history. It's very interesting. I mean, I will get to how the digital age has changed connoisseurship, but it used to be that you would have to have that all internalized in your head from reading books that were in a physical place, but now you can outsource a lot of that story to your iPhone, <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> and so, Michael, you have dedicated the bulk of your career to evangelizing for connoisseurship when it comes to antiques. And I wonder, what is it that first lit the fuse for you about antiques, and how did you educate yourself in this area, considering how vast the category is? 
I think like many of us, I was born with a sickness. <laughs> you know, an obsession with beauty, but no knowledge, of course. So you set out on the great journey to figure out what you're looking at. And, you know, I took a quite conventional course in seeking that through my education and through um, private time spent studying objects, painting, but in my case, the decorative arts uh, took up the bulk of my education. I'm interested in this idea of connoisseurship as a vocation that is, even as we speak, shifting from the realm of knowing to being. And now I do think that there are attribution issues still to sort out, and there will be for a long time, but a small group of people can do that, perhaps. In the wider realm of culture that I'm trying to speak to, attribution questions are not the principal concern. And to sort of latch onto something Dominique said, there's an aspect of pleasure to be found in connoisseurship that relates more to the realm of being than knowing. And I'm really interested in that because today, just as you said, we can log onto our phones and in some cases find the attribution that we might think is uh, authoritative. Maybe we have enough evidence not to question that. We can memorize it. But the experience that you have with a physical object in a room cannot be replicated by getting on your iPhone. And really knowing what you're looking at on a material level cannot be replicated through that digital experience. So, you know, there's an aspect of connoisseurship that is still relevant, that's very knowledge-based. You know, in the decorative arts, one still learns the taste of different types of wood in order to be able to discern what type of wood you're looking at and dealing with. And that's very important. But then there's also this separate realm of pleasure in which to even know what wood tastes like is a very special thing. And it's an aspect of perhaps being a, well, no one wants to call themselves a connoisseur. You know, no one we want to know. That would be a bit uh, objectionable. But someone who's pursuing connoisseurship, who's pursuing a life of pleasure and being with objects and art, wants to know the taste of that wood. And I think we have to find ways of preserving that in our culture. It's like a certain, like a, almost analogous to philosophy in which it's, it's something that you, um, yeah, it's a journey, it's, it's something you're hoping to attain. But it's interesting that we've all brought up the idea of pleasure, the job of the connoisseur as being somebody who can tell the difference between good and bad, and the pleasure of the connoisseur being um, that of somebody who can appreciate great art at its highest expression. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, um, and this is for anybody who, who wants to jump in, when was the last time that you were truly swept away <laughs> and surprised, maybe, by an encounter with incredible artwork or object. I just traveled to India, and I went to these incredible cave, Elephanta, next to Mumbai. And there are these incredible man-made carved stones. Some of them are seven, eight meter high. And there's a whole cult of the goddess Shiva. And not only the effort, of the making of them, the way they stand through time, the way, despite their history, that they had such an expression of humanness. There's the pursuer, the destroyer, and I don't remember the third one, but the, these three goddess sort of had a, a humanness, could have been done today. And they didn't lose temporaneity. They were atemporal in such an extraordinary way that it made me think that connoisseurship is constantly a quest. I, I knew nothing, dived into just a little bit to appreciate it. And the more I read about it, the more I was able to appreciate it. And I think there's also that in the being or when you said looking, 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 you know, you go, you're confronted with the image. It has its impact. That's pleasure, that's moment. But then connoisseurship is you start scraping and digging and digging and then the pleasure is much bigger but I agree, you never want to call yourself a connoisseur first. It's like a, a life journey. But you want to be on that quest. And, and this opened a new window in my way of even looking at some of the 20th century or contemporary art that I'm looking at. In December, I took uh, my older son, Leonardo, to What a name Florence. to carry. Well, we went to Rome, <laughs> yes, exactly. So it was a, it's a, high, a high bar. Um, and I, I took him to Rome and Florence. And 
I would have to say that the last time that I really saw something, and I'd seen it before, but I hadn't seen it in my two decades as an art collector. And so I saw it with a different eye. When I came upon Bernini's Apollo and Daphne, or Donatello's Mary Magdalene, I saw it, in it through, a different, through a different prism. And once again, the concept of what is beauty, because both of those are dealing with very difficult subjects. I've often thought that famous photograph by Robert Capra, the Spanish revolutionary crystallizing that moment of death, is the awesomeness of beauty. Because beauty is a very, very difficult subject to be able to get your head around. It's not just something that makes you feel good. It's something that makes you feel. And experiencing the art, which I don't collect, and of course they're in museums, through that prism after 20 years of looking at art with a buyer's eye made it a very, very different experience. And I, even today, just the, the thought of those sculptures, and of course seeing it, you know, with my 21, 22-year-old son, um, where he saw that for the first time. He couldn't remember the last time we were in Firenze. That blew me away. But the other aspect of that, if I may say it, it's a little bit more metaphorical, is that I spent a lot of time on preserving cultural heritage, antiquities, which are in war zones. And I chair an organization called Aleph, which does just that. And every week is a sensory overload in terms of being able to understand and to approve funding for the protection or the restoration of beauty, which is being destroyed as an act of volition hundreds of disbursements to Ukraine, for example, literally from Mali to Indonesia and everywhere else, where we started five, six years ago, we're now in 35 countries. And when people say, where will you be next? I just say, read online or read, read the papers, because unfortunately that business is what I call a growth industry, and it's only going to get worse. And so when you become more of a Connoisseur is such a loaded word these days, it's true. Um, but when, when you have developed that affinity and that passion and that ability to discern, and then you superimpose onto that the necessity to protect it, not from just the ravages of time, but from the ravages of politics, it puts that whole question of what is connoisseurship, to me, through a, a very different gauntlet. It's a very interesting way of looking at um patronage and philanthropy, because usually people think of preserving art in a museum as, as one of their, you know, their roles as a collector, in, but, but preserving art from threats out in the world is a very interesting and expanded. Well, it's the same as in wildlife conservation. I mean, the hand of man has uh, perhaps, but I think barely, made anything as beautiful as a tiger. But it's incumbent upon us to understand that beauty comes in different manifestations. It could be a tiger, it could be Rembrandt, it could be a Lamassu or a winged lion, you know, in, uh, in Mosul. But the common denominator is they are beautiful. The beauty touches the soul. And we, as our generation, or your generation, uh, not my generation, I'm, it's a different story, but we have this obligation to preserve the cultural and the natural endowment for future generations. And whether we're destroying it you know, through environmental degradation or through human conflict, we don't have the right not to pass this down so that other generations have the opportunity to use it or lose it. I'll start off by saying here, here. And, you know, it just strikes me that if we don't understand what a thing is and its true value, we can't preserve it in any context, in a museum or in a war zone. So cultivating that understanding through whatever means seems to be 
not just the highest priority in our field, but an emergency priority, you know, a priority with, with true urgency in it. There's a war zone, there's sort of the fight against the flattening of our understanding of the world of visual culture, of arts, of the built environment, and uh, perhaps in a less profound vein than this one, but in a vein that was still meaningful to me, Recently, on my own travels in Italy, I saw a small exhibition with a painting by Giacomo Bala, some furniture and some costume also designed by him. And I'd never seen any furniture or costume designed by him. I knew a couple of paintings, nothing more. And, you know, there was something moving, special, enlightening about seeing the objects with the painting. And I think that, for me, expresses something important about what we're discussing here. You know, it's, it's one thing to look at an image in a digital presentation. It's another thing to be in a space, sharing air and breath and the presence of a thing. And I really found that interacting with this furniture enlarged my understanding of the painting that was nearby in a way that I could not have achieved without being in the room. You know, an image sort of precedes a three-dimensional object for you. It flattens it, right? If we were looking at a photograph of this fireplace, we wouldn't be looking at an object. We'd be looking at an image of an object, right? It's already been flattened. So to take in the scope of a thing, its presence in person really is a very different kind of experience and one that I think is irreplaceable and that, that really changed my uh, perception of, of flat art in this context. But this is to me very much connoisseurship. And this is where, when you talk about preservation, where the younger generation, our kids, I, I was very stunned by see, see, look, look, where if you can bring that young generation to the three-dimensionality of the experience, then you plant a seed of desire for connoisseurship. And then that connoisseurship, I think raises awareness and a sense of responsibility, which is the one you've embraced so beautifully and which we all have to be really ambassador for. But it starts really, really there with that experience, that, that moment. TIFOF is a wonderful occasion for that kind of encounter because here we are with these beautiful booths. I mean, this incredible fair where um, art is displayed in the, the living, breathing context of the art market. And so that makes me, um, wonder, how does connoisseurship intersect with the art market? And is the best art the most expensive? Is vice versa? Is that the case? I, I put this to you. So when, when we, we were preparing the question, you, you brought Duveen and Berenson mm -hmm. together. <laughs> and it made me smile because I thought, that's such a controversial relationship. Why are you bringing the dealer and the connoisseur who had a sort of tacit and less tacit financial arrangement, which benefited from each other, which ended up, as you know, in a catastrophic fight. Um, it sort of took two things that are one of the problems of the art world, when suddenly you put the expertise and the commerce to intertwine. And the expertise, however great Berenson was, and I'm not there to criticize him, I, I love what he's done, I read his work, but at one point, you know, he was being paid to give expertise and he was being paid by one of the wealthiest, most interesting tastemaker and dealer of the time. But that relationship was sort of rotten at one point. And I think that, you know, being an art dealer and being an expert, you have to keep two different paths. Being a collector and being an expert, all these different pockets of what you call the market have to keep an independency and an independence and, and have to be uh, rigorous. So the connoisseur of a dealer is as deep and as uh, committed as a gallery, so a dealer wants to be. But then if the collector is looking for expertise and deeper connoisseurship, then they have to be able to find this. And it's a microcosm of all these different qualities, but they have to be kept quite separate, particularly, I think, the authentication, expertise, deep, deep knowledge, which is usually quite... Uh, um, focus on one period, one object, one medium, and then the general connoisseurship of a dealer that has their, their passion in their pockets, but doesn't have that expertise. And you can't merge the two of them, and you can't absolutely merge the two people in, in a marriage. We can dance together, but we cannot get married because I think it pollutes it. 
Well, I think there's, there's one place where connoisseurship and the market intersect in a way that we, we love at, at art and at news in particular. Um, and I'll tell a story, which is that one nice perk of being a connoisseur is that sometimes you can spot a diamond in the rough. And for instance, in 2015, there was a Dutch painting that went up for auction in New Jersey with an estimate of $800. People with good eyes realized that there was something special about this painting and bidding soared to the point where it was ultimately bought for $870,000. The painting was identified as an important early Rembrandt and then you bought it for $5 million. And so the connoisseur <laughs> who was able to spot that in the rough that, I think, is a good intersection yeah. of the market and connoisseurship. So I wonder, have any of you had the chance to have that good fortune descend on you where you find your eye has, enables you to find an can incredible I Can line? I add a, um, a twist to that? The good fortune of the dealer, a French dealer with no prior experience in Dutch art, of being able to identify what is actually the earliest known signed Rembrandt off of the internet was an extraordinary phenomenon, much to my luck. That painting was part of a series called The Five Senses, of which only three were known to have remained. The other two, we had no idea what they looked like, and they were presumed gone, but we knew that there was a series. We own two of them, and the other is in the museum, the Lachenhall Museum in Leiden. This painting, there was no image of it anywhere for 400 years. The dealers got a bank loan for the million dollars, and it so happened that the dealer walked into the Institut Custodia in Paris and told the director that he thought he had just acquired a Rembrandt. Now, working at the Institute was someone who had worked for us for several years. Wonderful, wonderful scholar. When she heard this, she asked her boss if he would be willing to ask the dealer if she could inform me that we now knew where this painting was, because by this time it was a phenomenon, a painting that had been classified as European school for three to $500, went for a million, and when they put the image on, people looked at it and said, ah, maybe that's right. When the dealer went to collect the painting, the first thing that he did was he brought it to me, because we were the natural, certainly one of the potential natural clients, and his aim was to take it back to Europe, clean it, and offer it at Tefaf. Where else? <laughs> Where else? <laughs> and, well, I was with half of that program, but not the other half. So I knew what he'd paid for it, and we sat down and I said, what are you looking for? He said a certain price, and I said, if I offered you this for a decision now, would you take it? And he did. And it was, for them, the biggest score that they had. Now, that was only part of the story. I'm in the exploration business, in the financial world, oil, gas, that kind of thing, in, in, in the old days, you know, looking for gold, that kind of thing. And the odds of being able to find something are 1,000 to 10,000 to one against you. So you have to have a very, very, very intimate relationship with La Fortuna to be able to be in that business. But I've also always felt that when a dealer finds the mother load, finds the bonanza against the odds, that it is also part of my obeisance to La Fortuna that I reward them without having any issue. I don't look at that and say, you should get 10% profit or whatever. No, this was a real find. This is a find of a lifetime for you. I want you to be rewarded for it. And he was. But he asked me, he said, can I take it to Tefaf? Because this is going to be a big deal. It's great for our gallery. And I said, yes, 
but you must make them understand the painting's already sold. I said, it has to be fully transparent. He said, fantastic. I said, the other thing is, leave my name out of it. For the first 15 years of our collecting, we were anonymous. And I just said, just leave my name out of it. I don't need any press or whatever. That didn't happen, it leaked. Um, but 200,000 people went to see the painting. Wow. Now, I'll give you a postscript. If these anecdotes are not interesting, just shut me down. Postscript. At that time, we were planning to have a coming out party at the Louvre because we were putting all of the information on a website which was being created, which would download everything and everyone could have free access to it, etc. So we went from anonymity to spotlights very quickly because we'd clearly been traveling um, against the tide. We had several hundred, 250 paintings, and nobody heard of us, and that was by design. Now, I had a meeting at the Louvre, and I said, you know, you really should have this painting here. And they said, no, can't have it. I said, look, it's been exhibited at the Getty, it's been exhibited at the Ashmolean, at the Rembrandt House. There's no issues of provenance. And he goes, I don't think you understand. We said no to protect you. And I said, and how's that? And they go, well, you're lending to us. You're having an exhibition, but um, you're not a national museum. We can't give you a national indemnity, which means if someone challenges the ownership of the painting while it's at the Louvre, we can't let it go on to, by this time we were going to the National Museum in Beijing, the Pushkin, the Hermitage, Louvre Abu Dhabi, etc. afterwards, and we have to keep it. And I said, so what's the problem? And it was Jean-Luc Martinez, great guy, and he said, uh, but Thomas, I don't think you uh, quite understand. And I said, no, 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 no je comprends. Uh, and he said, we would have to hold it back. And I said, what if I told you I don't care? He said, how could that be? And I said, what if I told you that if someone can prove that that painting rightfully belongs to them, they can have it? And he said, well, this changes everything. And I said, no fucking kidding. <laughs> um, and he said, but how do you say that? And I said, look, at the end of the day, as passionate as I am about these things, they are oil on panel or oil on canvas. And to the extent that I have my overriding mission amongst several others in my lives, it's to teach my kids the difference between right and wrong. And if that's the price that I have to pay to teach them that doing the right thing can be frustrating, but that doing the right thing is in and of itself the philosophy, then it's a small price for me to pay, which is to say, if it's not mine, I don't want it. And of course it was at the exhibition and then traveled the rest of the world with the other two in the series. When that painting came to me, I didn't need a Rembrandt scholar. He, he gave it to me and I said, yep, huh, it's right. You're not leaving with that painting. What an extraordinary story. I mean, interestingly, you mentioned that the first buyer spotted this online. Mm. They saw it online. And as you were saying before, very rightly, you know, uh, the internet flattens the images. You don't have that full 360 degree kind of intimate engagement with the artwork that you, you would have in, in real life. So that's, it kind of broaches the topic of how does connoisseurship change in the internet age? Are there digital tools that you've been finding that help enhance your ability to um, engage with art, to pursue connoisseurship? I want to defend the internet. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll make headlines that the millennial came out against the internet and we'll just shock everyone to death. So for the, for the lay person who hasn't explored this stuff, who's not sitting in this room, who might be in Alabama where I'm from, I encourage them always to utilize the online collections that are cropping up. Museums have done fabulous work in the past, especially 10 years, especially five years, especially in the last couple of years, scanning their works, often in high resolution, posting much more you know, authentic, high quality information online about works. And I think that it's a treasure trove. 
So as a first exposure to perhaps not an entire genre or area of art, but to a particular work, I actually think that uh, exploring online collections, exploring the sort of ultimate plurality of information about art that there is online is incredible. And so I certainly have benefited from having so much information at my fingertips. I mean, when you're in school or you're working and you don't have time or perhaps the resources to travel the world looking at art in person, it's wonderfully, wonderfully enriching to be able to even lie in bed and zoom in on a painting in the Prado's collection in your apartment in New York or in your house in Alabama. So I think that's a very special thing. And I think that social media, while it can, it can sort of narrow our world and lead us down eddies because the algorithm begins to know what we like or what we prefer and it feeds us more of that, if we sort of act against the algorithm, we can actually use social media as a tool of discovery and we can find things that we never might have discovered before. So there's this powerful um, expansion that I think we can take advantage of by using digital tools and we could perhaps talk more about them. But on the flip side, I've noticed that uh, young curators in museums or academics are seeing less and less material in person. So while I might encourage you know, my siblings or friends to explore online collections, to see all that's available to be seen online, I often encourage the academics I know who are training to perhaps take a break and go on a tour of duty in an auction house or with a dealer. You know, notice that as you were talking about discoveries, you were focusing on dealers and collectors, not on curators. And we love our curatorial friends, but I'd love to read a story about a curator who discovers a previously unrecognized masterpiece, but you don't as often. They don't handle as much material. And um, so one thing I think that's very special and, 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 and kind of uh, new in this moment is that as some of the barriers between the museum world and the market break down, I've seen younger people be unafraid to sort of take that tour of duty in an auction house or with a dealer and then come back to the academic world. I think often with an exposure to much, much more material than they would have seen early in their museum career. So it sort of depends on the position of the person, but I think that the internet can be uh, an extraordinary tool for discovering. You mentioned that curators are not usually credited with discovering artworks, but they do discover artists which is a, uh, a, great, a great service to the art community. But you work with many younger specialists in your gallery. You've always worked with specialists who have worked for you and have learned from you. And just as you um, <coughs> learned from uh, David Maling, uh, Simone de Puri, um, Anthony Daffe. And connoisseurship is something that has always been passed down from generation to generation. Is there a little bit of a divide between the generations that are coming up who are so extremely online and the generations that came before? Is it, is it somehow different passing on? Yes. It's a, such an interesting question. Sometimes I, I feel I've sort of aged inadvertently because they have a facility and a different way of learning, a different way of looking, and they gravitate to different art and it keeps you in your, on your toes. And I feel sometimes that the younger generation actually are as much learning as teaching. And I think that digital tool that you're referring to, which yes, is the internet, and yes, it's the phone, and yes, it's the social media, is also the incredible capability of the camera. I mean, today, the taking of images, there are now companies that take images where you can literally travel into the painting, travel into the pixel. So I think that being comfortable with the digital, which to me took a bit longer than I wish and still is a bit long, but to be comfortable with the digital gives you an immediacy and an accessibility that's actually sometimes overwhelming. The counter effect with what you would call the younger generation is impatience, is sort of image saturation, and the sort of new world for ADD, it's very hard to pause and says, okay, I'm actually going to go further and deep in. 
And so the way I was mentored was with men and women that really would spend hours looking at an object, hours touching, looking at the back, in the corridors of the auction houses. And the back of the work was as important as the front of the work. And, and the time to explore one work or one period or one exhibition is completely different. Today, if I want to take a group of younger art beginners, it has to go fast. We don't do an exhibition in an hour and a half. You do an exhibition in 10 minutes. So the whole pace is different. And, and I'm not saying that they will know less, but they are learning differently, looking differently. And that passage of the baton is, I think, quite different than the baton was given to me. I think that gap is, is it's bigger. Than, and, and in a way, if we want to pass a meaningful baton, we need to speed up and learn differently. So it's, it's, a, it's part, I think, of a much deeper cataclysm that we're seeing today. Without passing any judgment, I think it's very different to be a connoisseur of NFTs than it is to be a connoisseur of Rembrandt. It, take, it, has, a, a di it has a different kind of temporality to it, a, a different kind of, of sustained, potentially. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this. This is you, going to take a dangerous turn. But, but, oh, oh but yes. Interesting. You, you have um, you've spoken before about how Rembrandt could use potentially a brand refresh for this current generation. I think you, you even compared it to when Alessandro Bacchelli took over Gucci and refreshed the, the Gucci brand. And how would you do it? The distinction was by the time Bacchelli came in, the Gucci brand really needed, um, well, even before him, um, you know, the soul came in and, you know, it took what had been a very, very sexy brand and had been diminished um, by many, many different factors. Rembrandt is already a great brand. In any top 10 greatest artists, you'll find Rembrandt usually amongst the top three, you know, with Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and et cetera, et cetera. That's not the, the question. The question is how to leverage the brand. Very different. So you're already starting with something that in people's minds, when they hear Rembrandt, they associate that with, oh, this is something that I should look at. Any museum exhibition which has even a Rembrandt in the exhibition will usually include Rembrandt in the name, Rembrandt and his times or something like this, because Rembrandt, like Vermeer, like Van Gogh, you know, like Picasso, etc., people know this is an important artist. My mission, as I said, was to make people today understand why Rembrandt is still of significance to them. That was my mission when we had the coming out of the Louvre, and we had 30 paintings there out of 200, 250. But it was the first time that I'd seen even 30 paintings together, because we never lived with one of our paintings. We were a lending library the paintings would immediately go to museums. So I saw the 30 paintings, which included 10 or so Rembrandts at that time, and I was astonished. And people would say, oh, you must be so proud. And I would say, mm, no, pride has nothing to do with it. It doesn't really take a genius to buy Rembrandt. It takes a genius to be Rembrandt. And my sense of mission to give back to Rembrandt for all of the joy that I've had for coming on to 55 years since I first encountered him, um, it's to be able to make this generation understand the relationship, the genetic transference from Rembrandt all the way through to today. And in Paris, I said, now, if I manage to get the Chinese to see it that way, then I might consent to embracing a little bit of pride because it's Asia's century. And if the Chinese see Rembrandt not as some sort of cultural artifact, a vestige of European colonialism, etc., but rather as something that's relevant to them, then I would have accomplished something for the next 400 years of Rembrandt because Rembrandt becomes important to them. And the Chinese media that attended the opening at the Louvre then went back to Beijing and wrote articles about the exhibition and what was coming. And we ended up taking twice as many paintings to China. 
to the National Museum, then to the Long Museum. And before the paintings arrived, the Chinese government had changed the status of the exhibition from important to national importance, which means you'd better go see it. <laughs> and if you're a teacher or, or you know, you're taking your students to see this because this is important and it still has relevance to us as China. Russia, different experience. There they get Rembrandt from birth, Catherine the Great, of course. And it's not a, it was a different kind of mission. But it was also the only Russo-American cultural exchange in years up to that point in 2018. And unfortunately, or for whatever, will remain so for uh, a number of years uh, henceforth. But very different. When we took it to the Arab world, to Louvre Abu Dhabi, it was the first exhibition where more people went to see an exhibition than were actually going to see Jean Nouvel's building, which is, of course, a masterpiece in and of itself. So using Rembrandt evangelically um, to build bridges at a time when I, like many other people, we're talking here 2017 to 2019, 2020, for me it was like the most expensive therapy session in world history because as an American, you know, I felt very reluctant to lecture anyone but I was out there promoting universal values, tolerance, humanism, and not changing my tune in any location, whether it was Beijing, Moscow, or Abu Dhabi. And they appreciated it. Now, Rembrandt became, as one journalist put it, a tool of war, in a sense, waging a certain battle for values. And he lends himself to that. So the brand, I'm not worried about. And it's about taking advantage of an opportunity. I get much more pleasure out of deploying the art than not. And as you know, for the first 15 years, we were anonymous. And then it was a truly great connoisseur of Dutch art. For my mind, the greatest of his generation, Arthur Wheelock, who was the curator of Netherlandish art, Northern art at the National Gallery, who was the one who told me, it's great that you're lending, anonymously or whatever you're doing, whatever, it's great, the paintings are out there, but you have to share what you have because of the way we collected. We didn't have one of an artist. If we were interested in that artist, we would have a dozen from their juvenilia through to their late period. He said, that's a study collection. And my wife, who's much more low key and modest than I am, and I, had to decide, are we gonna cross that Rubicon? Because I know from previous experience that when we reveal ourselves in something, that becomes the story. And it was because of that that we created an online catalog, which is, in Old Masters, I'm told, one of the best that's out there. One of the things that I insisted upon was that it be free, for everyone to be able to gain access to whatever images, all the information on condition reports, everything, everything. The technology is fabulous. I completely agree with what you said. I will get catalogs now, but what I really do is I go online, and if the website is good, it will take you right there and you can see every brushstroke. It's fabulous, and I also believe, this may be more controversial, that the internet, that technology, by allowing for the fractionalization of art, talk about the distinction between fractionalization and democratization and NFTs and whatever, is going to be one of the biggest boons to even my area of particular interest and passion. And I do believe that one day when millions of people can own a piece of a Rembrandt, it's going to be a turning point for that mission of leveraging Rembrandt or Titian or others who had such a bearing on art all the way to today. So I'm extremely excited about what the advent of technology can mean to be able to get more intellectual and any other kind of ownership in art, people tend to spend quite a lot of time 
researching something if they're going to buy it. You know, I mean, it's a truism that people will spend more time researching different microwaves than they will on which fund manager to give their life savings. <laughs> but once people are committed to buying something, they actually take an interest, and maybe their kids will take an interest. And maybe, you know, I, I think it's a, the brave new world, I think, is absolutely wonderful. I would just uh, perhaps quickly venture that history is undergoing a bit of a brand refresh right now. All of history. So there's this idea that we legitimize something from history by creating a genealogy that connects it to modernism, for example. I mean, this was a very popular maneuver that we saw in the second half of the 20th century. You know, this 16th century thing is interesting because it prefigures something that you love about mid-century art. That narrative is really dead for younger people. What we're interested in, I think, increasingly, is what was the 16th century really like? It was bloody, it was sweaty, people were having gay sex, women were making paintings, some of which we you know, have only recently identified. That history is very interesting to anyone. It's interesting to a connoisseur, it's interesting to someone who really wants to come to terms with what the history of the world was, not what we thought it was during different periods. And the internet is actually expanding that conversation. Younger people are wanting to have that conversation. And I often talk about it in the decorative arts as a shift from the parlor or the context of reception to the workshop, the context of production. In the realm of New York City furniture, furniture made in the 18th century, for example, there were a large number of black craftspeople producing the high style objects that have been, you know, highly valued in the centuries since. Black upholsterers, most of whom are unnamed, that were simply not discussed. They were not known about or written about on museum labels at any time. And the fact that we are learning more about those craftspeople, even if they remain unnamed, and learning more about what you know, 18th century, 19th century New York was really like, I think expands interest and appreciation among younger people in ways that we can only begin to understand. Uh, but in, in a way, it's more human. You're talking about a digital tool, but it's bringing a much more humanness. Because exactly. you're right, people are interested to know how people live, what they touch, with who they were. And it's, it's not just a lineage. It's not anymore actually history. It's what is that moment and how is it relevant today? Mm -hmm. And I think the issue of relevance is a big part of uh, connoisseurship. I think to tie it all together before going to the audience, the idea of storytelling. You were talking about how the story of art before Rembrandt and after Rembrandt changed. Then you have to understand Rembrandt's piece in that story. and that, That's a big part of connoisseurship. But now the vanguard of connoisseurship is looking for the untold stories the additional, you know, the who else was in the room, who else was at the time, who else was doing this, whose story needs to be told. And that, that's really where connoisseurship today seems to be um, moving. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. Special thanks this week to Tifoff, Dominique Levy, Thomas Kaplan, and Michael Diaz-Griffith. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.